Here we have the concentration of the Christian mystery <coughs> in these three days. Today, the death of God, then the burial of God, and then the resurrection of God. And when you read it, you may think it is referring to someone outside of yourself. If I use the word God, or the word Christ, the word Jesus, the word Lord, and in any way it conveys the sense of an existence, someone, or something outside of yourself, you have the wrong concept of God or Christ. We are told, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Do you not realize that you are the temple of the living God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? So if the word conveys this something outside of yourself, you've got the wrong God. <coughs> so the one spoken of who was crucified is crucified on you. And the only cross that he ever bore is the cross you wear the form that you wear, that garment of flesh and blood. That's the one spoken of when you are told, if you would follow after me, take up your cross daily and come after me. Don't you take it up daily? <clears throat> Don't you every morning after oblivion return to this cross? And Don't you take it up? and go through all the sorrows of the world? Are you not told, should not Christ suffer all these things and then enter into his glory? So the Christ on the cross is seated right here. And he's buried, not in the Near East, as they're looking day after day for some little sepulcher. He is buried in the skull of man. That's where he's buried. And he will rise out of that tomb where he is buried. And the tomb is the skull of man. He will rise there. He will awaken in the skull. And when he awakens, he will come out of that tomb. And all the imagery of scripture concerning his birth will surround the one who awakens in his own skull and comes out of his own skull. And that is the concentrated drama that is taking place in memory, I would say, today. For this is the memorial. What took place today, and will take place tomorrow in the churches, and on Sunday. This is the great mystery. Now, tonight, I will share with you what I know from experience. Let us go back to a portion of the Lord's Prayer. First of all, let us take it in its original form. There was a translation by Farrar Fenton. His father asked him, the son being the outstanding Greek scholar. And the father asked him to translate the Lord's Prayer in the most literal manner possible. And this is the letter of the Son to the Father. And he said to his Father, this is the literal translation of the original Greek. Our Father in the heavens, thy name must be being hallowed. Thy kingdom must be being restored. Thy will must be being done. As in heaven, so in earth. He tells his father that all other translations were taken from a translation of the Latin. And the Latin has no 
spirit of the imperative passive mood that was used in the original Greek and therefore it could not convey the sense that the Savior intended as Matthew and Luke expressed it in the original Greek. So we'll take now the statement, thy kingdom must be being restored. As he said, this imperative passive mood is to me a standing order, something that is to be done absolutely and continuously. Conceive a play, an eternal drama, which is God's plan of redemption, and conceive of it as an occurrence, a simple occurrence without reference to completeness or incompleteness, without reference to duration or repetition, without reference to its position in time, although sometimes with reference to past time. Just imagine an eternal play, and you and I, as sons of God, we see the play. But we see it as something external to ourselves, as we see a play. This play will lift us, if we experience the play cast in the central role, it will lift us to a level far beyond where we are as the spectator. We together, the sons of God, form God. For the word God is Elohim. It's a plural word. One made up of others. All the sons together form the Father. We, the sons, observing the play, are now going to be cast in the central role of that play. We're not going to be spectators. We are going to be the actor, the central actor in the drama. You can't do it in heaven. You do it on earth. That here, this bliss spoken of in scripture, that we cannot actually consummate bliss without being generated on earth in these bodies of flesh and blood. So we come down, penetrate and annex the brains of bodies on earth. We are the sons of God. In doing that, we die. This is our crucifixion. When we penetrate and annex the brains of the bodies that we wear. This is our Calvary. As we are told in Scripture, and when he reached the place called the Skull, there they crucified him. The Skull. Not a little place that resembled a Skull, but literally the Skull. It's called Calvary. Well, Calvary is a translation of the Greek word cranium, which means skull. Mark uses the Hebrew word, or the Aramaic word, which <clears throat> is Golgotha. Well, Golgotha means skull. So no matter what word they use, it is still skull. Calvary, Golgotha, skull, or cranium. All these words are used in different translations, but each word used means skull. And it's not as our scholars will tell us that they called it the skull because it resembled the human skull, the area where he was crucified. It's literally the skull of man. That's where he is crucified. That's where he is buried. <clears throat> he is buried in the skull of man. 
because he is in the skull of man, and that skull is his tomb. When he is resurrected, he is resurrected there. He awakens in that tomb. He comes out of that tomb unassisted by any midwife, by anyone. And he rolls away that stone, which is the base of his skull, and he comes out of that hole, which is an opening. And he comes out in the same manner that a child comes out of the womb of woman. He squeezes himself out as a child squeezes out of the womb of woman. And when he completely comes out, he looks back at that out of which he came, and it's the body. That very body that formerly he wore. He didn't realize that he was buried in the skull. For unnumbered centuries, he walked and took up his cross every day and walked in the dream world. This world is a dream. And he walked in this world, believing himself to be something completely independent of everything else. And he is not a dreamer, no, he's a reality. This is not a dream. But the day that he begins to awake within him, when he begins to rise within himself, he realizes he has been dreaming all along. <clears throat> now he is awakened from the dream of life. <clears throat> it is we who lost in these stormy visions keep with phantoms the unprofitable strife. And we think that we are completely awake and we are doing all the things here, fully conscious, not knowing that we are dreaming. And the dream is projected, as it is when you dream at night. That's a dream within a dream. And this is the dream. <clears throat> so as we are told in Scripture, he was crucified on Golgotha, that's the skull. Buried on Golgotha, that's the skull. And then he rose out of the same tomb in which he was placed. Now, see the drama. A wonderful play that takes place forever and forever. No one knows when it will come to an end. When it comes to an end, the drama is over. We are now reproducing in ourselves what we saw. Now, you're told in the third chapter of the book of Galatians. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Now, if you read the story carefully, Abraham, in the 25th chapter of Genesis, the very beginning of the 66, the 66 books, he is dead, he dies, and he is buried. By the 25th chapter of Genesis, Abraham ceases to be. We are told in the book of Galatians, which is the first book, chronologically speaking, in the New Testament, not canonically, but chronologically, it was the first book written by Paul, which came before the gospel. Here we are told that the scripture, well, it could only be the Old Testament, because there was no new. And it could only be the first 25 verses of the book of Genesis and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, which means the heathen, for the same word is goyim. And so the goyim is the heathen, that which is other than the Hebrew. <clears throat> that being justified, then he foreshow, that is, he gave a preview of the gospel to Abraham. Now we are told in the gospel, and Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day. He saw it, and he was glad. He saw the fulfillment of a play, which was that the sons of God would actually become God. That all would be raised to the level of God the Father. But they could be raised to that level only by passing through the horrors of this world. <clears throat> and you couldn't pass through the horrors of the world until you actually became embedded 
in a garment of flesh and blood. So the sons of God fell in love with the daughters of men and came down and penetrated and annexed the brains of these garments of flesh. And their penetration and annexation of the brain animated the bodies. Then we became subject to everything subject to man. Everything that man is capable of doing, the Son of God had to experience. <clears throat> so as Blake said, I do not consider either the wicked or the just to be in a supreme state, but to be every one of them states of the sleep into which the soul may fall when it leaves paradise following the serpent. The symbol of wisdom, the symbol of knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> so we come into this world and experience all the things that man could experience. <clears throat> Pardon me. Having gone through all, we come to the climax. And the climax is resurrection. And may I tell you, it's an actual, literal fact. I have experienced it. I have reached the end of the drama. It came to me in 1959. I am now approaching my 12th birthday after my birth from above. And we are told we will not return to the kingdom of God, raised to the level of God the Father, until we are born from above. And birth from above and resurrection coincide. Man awakens within his skull and he comes out of that skull to find the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and the witnesses, the three witnesses present to the event. He is unseen by the witnesses because he is spirit. He is God. It is God being born. Born this time not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So God is giving birth to himself, raising himself to higher levels of his own being. So all the sons come down into this world and they go back after they have completed the journey and they can't get back until they are born from above. As told us in the third chapter of John, you a master of Israel, and you do not know, unless you are born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And do you not know, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up? And that is a literal fact. In the same serpentine manner, you are lifted up. And when you take off the garment after these experiences, and they are for mighty peculiar, supernatural experiences. After the four, you will remain and you will tell it until that moment in time when you depart. Not restored anymore to life, not restored. You are now in the kingdom, clothed in your garment of glory. You are sure power Share wisdom, and yet all guided and motivated by love, for God is love. You do not exercise that power in any manner save motivated by love. You do not exercise your divine wisdom in any way save by love. For love embraced you before the whole thing started. There is no transforming power in death, as we call death here, none. About 15 or 20 years ago in Barbados, my wife and I, that is the little family of three, my little girl, <clears throat> we were there for oh, maybe four or five months. There was a 
Cuffell from Trinidad. He was a major in the British Army, serving, not serving, but working in Trinidad in some oh, commercial adventure. And he came to Barbados with his wife for a vacation. And he was all enthused about my thoughts concerning the law of God. At the same time at the hotel was an elderly gentleman who had retired. He was a professor of chemistry at one of the great universities of England. And he came out to set up some kind of a factory with local money, but with his knowledge, making soap. For we thought if we could simply produce local soap, we could save the currency we needed so badly that was foreign currency, especially American currency and Canadian currency. If we could only produce soap out of the materials we had locally, well then that would be perfect. So he came out to set the thing going. One day, over a few cocktails, this man, Major Morrison, said to him, you know, Neville has a concept concerning uh, the spirit world. That's how we describe it. And he began to discuss certain things concerning one of my books, which I gave him, and he was, he was reading the book. Well, the old gentleman said, I am not interested. I call myself an agnostic. In fact, I think I am really an atheist. But to, make, to soften the blow, I say I am an agnostic. Everything in my life must be proven. I am a chemist. My whole life has been devoted to chemistry, to this physical world. And I can see nothing but this physical world. I'll take your brain, your body, everything, and reduce it to simple chemicals. And so I am not interested, said the old gentleman to Major Morrison. I am present. No offense, said he. I said, no, forget it. You are here to do a job, and undoubtedly you will do a wonderful job, and give us a local factory that we can make our own soap and save foreign currency. Well, last Wednesday morning, on my return from my usual visits night after night as I'm teaching what I'm teaching you, but I'm not confined to this, for the world does not end where our senses cease to register it. When a man dies, as we call him dying, he doesn't cease to be, he is solidly real, restored in a body just like this, only he is young. He is about 20, he drops off at 90, he finds himself 20, restored to life. But he hasn't changed one iota. His ideas that were present before he died are his ideas after, whatever they were. If he was stupid here, he's just as stupid there. If he was a thief here, he's a thief there. If whatever he is, he is it there. Well, here on my way back on Wednesday morning, I encounter these two. Sir Archibald Cuke, who is the other gentleman, and the professor. And Archie is saying to this man, the professor, there's going to be a demonstration tonight on television. And he called it Kelly, for in England they always speak of it as the telly. There's going to be a demonstration tonight on the telly, a scientific demonstration. Well, that would interest the old man, scientific. But then the old gentleman discovered what he meant by scientific was a psychical demonstration, to demonstrate the reality of psychism, like extrasensory perception and all kinds of things concerning the psychic world. Well, the old man turned, as he would, sour. It meant nothing to him. But here is Archie, the same Archie. He is all completely, uh, I would say, moved emotionally because it's coming on tonight, and that's exactly what he always wanted. Why he was here, though a very able accountant, he had a big business in, New York, in uh, Barbados, taking care of all the big businesses and closing their books for them and advising them. But he was vitally interested in psychism. He was a very devout Methodist, in spite of the fact that he smoked, uh, he was a chain smoker, which the Methodist of Hall, and he could drink anyone under the table. Still, he called himself a devout Christian and a good Methodist. The other one was the atheist or the agnostic. 
but they have not changed one bit. One is still interested in these things, and the other is not. One is still the scientists, and they don't even know that they have departed this section of time. They do not know, because no one dies. God is the God of the living, and nothing dies. Because it doesn't die, how can you tell a man, when you're looking at him and you're talking to him, don't you know I went to your funeral? He'll laugh at you. What funeral? Well, I went to your funeral. I saw them put you down into the little grave. But he starts to laugh at you, as though you're insane. Because he knows he is not dead. But he doesn't know that he went through the so-called gate that we on this side of the veil call death. That happened to me years ago, back in 1946 it was. I came out here in 45. No, it was 47. I came out here in 45, returned in 1946 in the summer. I got a cable from New York City that my secretary had dropped dead. It was a hot August day, and they found the body on the floor. He had died of a heart attack. I went back and took care of his funeral. He was a Catholic. And I gave him a good Catholic funeral in Haverstraw, New York. Six months later, I find myself in the world where he is. I am fully awake and fully conscious. I know that Jack died six months ago. I meet my sister-in-law, who always say to me, I like you as a brother-in-law because you're very kind to my sister and to your child, which is my niece. But I don't believe one word that you talk about. I don't believe you at all. At that moment, here is my former and now departed secretary, Jack Butler. And I say to my sister-in-law, Al, her name is Alice. I said, Al, so you don't believe what I teach. You don't believe in survival, because she always said, I'm a good Christian, but you survive only through the loins of your parents. <clears throat> and you perpetuate yourself in that manner. I said, how can you be a Christian and, and tell that? Christianity is based upon the foundation stone, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man. And you tell me now that there is no such thing as a Bible. Life everlasting is the third stone of the great foundation stone of Christianity. Fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, and life everlasting. She said, I still don't believe what you teach. And I said to her, then look at Jack. And she said to me, what has that to do with it? I said, don't you know that Jack died? And her face blanked. She knew Jack had died. I said, all right, there he is. He's alive, isn't he? And Jack said to me, who died? I said, Jack, you died. I went to your funeral. I buried you. I got a good Catholic funeral for you in Haverstraw, New York. Put you all the way down and covered you up with a lot of sand. And that's where that body was and still is, became now. He said, who's dead? I said, you aren't dead, Jack but you died. He said, how stupid. I'm not dead, but I died. Jack had gone six months and did not realize he had gone. People do not change, I'm telling you. They haven't any concept because they're still dreaming. You're dreaming this world and you're dreaming that world too. You only awaken when within your own skull you become awake. And you are born from above. When you are born from above, you come out. And all that is said in Scripture concerning the birth of Christ, you experience, then you realize who Christ is. Until then, you thought he was another. Something in history 2,000 years ago. He is not another. It is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. And do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you and that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Well, people do not realize this. Today, in the Christian churches, maybe 
Hundreds of millions obtained some portion of the three-hour service. On Sunday morning, they'll be crowded to capacity in all the churches of Christendom. You know why? To show their new hats and their new dresses. On Sunday, on Fifth Avenue in New York City, they'll be coming out of St. Pat's and St. Thomas and all the churches, and cameramen will be there to photograph them. And do you know why? Two months ago, that was arranged. These social prominent women went into the uh, editor of the New York Times and the other papers, and they made appointments. They told them exactly what they're going to wear, what the hat is like, what church they will attend, and what door they will make an exit from. And so the New York Times will send their cameraman. And when this thing comes out, dressed as he knows it's supposed to be dressed like this, he is going to photograph it and put it in the paper on Monday morning. And so on Monday, this coming Monday, maybe 50,000 more papers than normally are sold will be sold because each will buy a hundred. Throw all the paper away and keep just the one page and send it off to all their friends and keep a few for themselves for posterity. And then the New York Times can claim that they have so many more sales. And all the advertisers who advertise in that paper for Monday just simply had a blank because they aren't reading anything but their own little section. And it was all prearranged by the editor. That I know from experience, for my same Jack Butler, when they made a mistake in one of my ads once, he went down to investigate. So he went to the editor of the religious section. And she said he had to do something to pacify him. And she said, how would you like to see the uh, editorial staff of the social section of our paper? Well, Jack was always up for fun. He said, I would love it. And it was just about two months before Easter. And all these ladies and their daughters were all around the place, dozens and dozens of them waiting to be interviewed, each is going to say exactly what we're going to wear. That's been ordered. The dress is all ordered and maybe already delivered. And the kind of a hat and what church we attain and where we're going to come out. And the cameras will be there to photograph it. And the morning paper will carry it as spontaneous. All spontaneous. And that's the dream world. A man just retired after a very successful 30 years in the show business. His name is Sinatra. I recall this vividly when he was a young boy. I came out of my tailor on 48th Street, which was between 5th and Madison Avenue. I'm walking towards 5th. When I got to 5th, here is three dozen young girls, all 16, 17. And here is a cab right in the middle of 5th Avenue. And here is this young lad. Well, he's 10 years my junior, so he was then, well, whatever it was then. When he got started, his foot on the runway, the cab stalled, traffic backed up, all the horns are honking, the cop is inqui inquiring, and he is signing autographs to these 30 or more. All that was prearranged to block the traffic. So what? They'll give him a ticket. They give the cabbie a ticket. And he'll pay it. It'll cost him, what, $50, $100? But the publicity, all that was part of the motion. He kept that going until now. And people think, what a big, wonderful man. That has been promoted from the time that he began to breathe as a young lad, as a singer. And it goes all through our entire dream world. And how do you go? Don't stop it. You can't stop it. It's part of the dream world. I am not telling you of the dream world. I am telling you of the world wherein you will awake. And when you awake, you'll be clothed in your immortal body. And that is heaven. Heaven is not a realm. It's not an area. Wherever you are clothed in your glorified body is heaven, because nothing remains imperfect in your presence. If you walk through the petrified forest, it will all burst into foliage. If you walk in the desert, the desert would blossom. Everything would become beautiful. And things long dead 
or not even visible, will suddenly appear because you walk by. So wherever you go, clothed in your glorified body, which comes with your resurrection, makes every place that you go perfect. For wherever you are, things must be perfect. That's what we are celebrating this week. But they aren't telling it that way. They are telling of a little man who died a horrible death 2,000 years ago. And then they took him down from the tree and then put him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. You are the one spoken of. And you are still hanging on that tree in a way. For you are nailed upon this body. And the nails are vortices. Six vortices. A vortex, a vortex, a vortex, a vortex. And both feet. And they are whirling vortices that nailed you here. And may I tell you from my own experience, it was sheer ecstasy. It wasn't painful. There was no pain whatsoever. Sheer ecstasy. And then oblivion. And that oblivion was a complete forgetfulness of the being that you are. And you were buried in your skull. And in that skull you dreamed the dream of life. As you are dreaming it now. And because it is a dream, if you know it's a dream, you can dream anything to be. If you know it's a dream. You can control the dream. So what would the feeling be like if it were true? Well, you name what it is you would like to be true. And naming it, you dream it just as though it were true. Remain faithful to your assumption. And that assumption of yours, though, at the moment, appears to be false and denied by your senses. If you persist in it, it will harden into fact. This is the story. And I am telling you what I know that I have experienced. I have experienced the law bringing things into being that I dare to assume because I wanted them to be brought into being. And the other, which is the fulfillment of God's promise. For I was that Abraham, so are you. And we were shown the gospel beforehand. We were given a preview of it. And we were told, you will go into a world that is not yours. And there you will be enslaved. And there you will be injured. And there you will be maltreated. But after 400 years, you will come out. Now, the 400 is not 400 as you measure time. 400 is simply a symbolical number of a cross. It is a numerical number of the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is the tope. And tope has the symbol of a cross. And this is the cross. So as long as I bear this, I am in the world of the furnaces. But I will come out of it. I will awaken within it, come out of it. And one day soon after I awaken within it and come out of it, I will shed it. And shedding it, I will go back to the glory that was mine before that the world was. But enhanced by reason of wearing the cross in this world. Because no one, but no one can consummate this bliss that we saw before the world was. Unless he is generated here in this world in flesh and blood. So I come down and I find myself wearing a garment. Woven in the womb of a woman. And I put on that garment and I'm nailed on it. And then I'm buried in that garment but buried in the skull. And because I'm buried in the skull, I come out of the skull. And when I come out of that skull, still wearing the garment, for a little interval of time to tell and share it with my brothers, to encourage them to continue, no matter what happens, to continue. Dream nobly and realize the dream, but dream nobly, because in the not distant future, you're going to awaken. And when you awaken, you're going to take off the little garment. And that is the cross that you wore for your journey, which is called in scripture, to 400 years. Really, it's thousands of years.
We've been wearing it for thousands of years. For there is no death, really, only restoration. Transformation in one sense. You move through the gate, don't even know you've gone. I've got a call from New York today, 3 o'clock this afternoon. And there was a voice, a very sad voice. I said, hello, he said, Neville, this is Louise. I have sad news for you. I said, what happened, my darling? She said, Joseph died today. He died in my arms. I said, was he sick? No, just a great, well, a rupture of the aorta. Right in my arms and Neville's arms. Neville is my little namesake, one that I met before he came into this world. He's now 17, so together we held him. And he suffered seemingly for a little, little while, not too long, maybe a half an hour. He seemed to be in great pain, and then that was it. But he was 77, lived a full, wonderful life, and will leave her a considerable fortune. Factories here, factories in Paris, factories in Puerto Rico. And so, financially speaking, there is no problem but a great tear. And what could I say to her? Couldn't even get her off the wire. But tell her certain stories. That Joseph, he lived a full, wonderful life up to the very end. Up to the end. To him, the spirit world, let it come later, he said. Always let it come later. Tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow. But now, he was, after all, he was a couturier, making passions for the beautiful ladies and everything concerning the beauty of the physical form, and he loved it. And he played the field perfectly, even to the end, and he was 77. And so, Joseph will still be the Joseph that I knew. He will not be interested in the birth from above. He will not be interested in the word of God. He made a fortune. And he's left a fortune. All to Louise and his one child, Neville. So they will have this enormous estate. And it really is enormous. But he is still the same Joseph. And when he finds himself, as he will now, not 77, but 20, and what a joy for him. He'll be 20 <clears throat> without any interest in spirituality, an interest in the human form. But they will come at the very end of the journey, as you're told in the eighth chapter of Amos. I will send a famine upon the world. It will not be a hunger for bread, nor will it be a thirst for water but for the hearing of the word of God. It will come to all, but it only comes at the end. It's the eighth chapter of Amos, the eighth verse. A hunger, and you cannot resist that hunger. That not a thing in the world can divert you. They can give you millions, it doesn't interest you. They can make you all kinds of offers, and it doesn't interest you. Only the word of God and the understanding of that word. Now, speaking of the word of God, the 8th chapter, also the 8th verse of Nehemiah. And you will read from the book, from the book of God. And you will read it with understanding, so they will have meaning when you read it. And the whole book unfolds within you, because in the end, you're only going to fulfill the word of God. You being the Son of God, who is the Word of God, you are alive and you are sent into the world, the living Word, to realize within yourself the written Word. So, today, the Memorial Day. Tomorrow, Memorial, and Easter's Memorial too. It's simply a memory. But you saw it before that the world was. It was all foreseen. Then you forgot it as you were nailed upon the cross. And then you played your part as you had to play. And you loved and you hated 
you were injured and you injured. You were the judge and the one judge, and you've gone through the entire gamut of things that man can experience. But I mean the whole. And when you have played all, and you were the big shot and the little one, you come to the end, and then the hunger possesses you for the word of God. And then it unfolds within you. And you realize you are the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the scripture speaks. But no one who actually knows who he is would ever reveal it to the world. He doesn't reveal it. He knows exactly who he is. And he goes about his business telling it to the few who would listen. But he doesn't go out and try to demonstrate anything on the outside. 